Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number five as we wrap up these eight um, ways to happiness that Jesus has talked about here in the passage. I want to say a word of greeting to uh, Matthew Slimp's mom and dad for being with us uh, from East Tennessee. And uh, as they say up in East Tennessee, I'm, I'm, I'm way old glad and elephant proud to have you here uh, today. That's the biggest words that I know. And so uh, just grateful that you have come and uh, we've missed seeing you. Um, the scripture is in uh, verse five of chapter five. Blessed are the meek. Now, let me just uh, stop there uh, before I give you the promise and let you know that uh, there's a great translation here that, that really is, is better, and it says, uh, blessed are the gentle. Uh, in our culture and in our um, interpretation of the word meek, it implies weakness. And uh, this term in no way uh, implies weakness. So a better, better term is the term gentleness. Bless those that are gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, they're they're going to get it all. Do you, do you believe that? Well, I, I believe it just simply because Jesus said it. And uh, that's good enough for me. That If I want it all, then I've got to become a gentle person and then the world is going to be mine. Now, <clears throat> I know that you're not oblivious to what goes on on social media. Um, but uh, in our time right now, I don't know of a better message uh, that we could have than the one that's today to address uh, the comments that we see on social media. Uh, many are mean, mean-spirited, arrogant, rude, if you will. And, and let me just say, um, people choose to use social media and uh, coming at people from that angle because they're not strong people, but really because they're weak people. Um, the Bible tells us that we're to be gentle, that the world is going to be ours. Let me define what that word uh, in the scripture, it, it's really the word uh, pr pr protes, protes, P -R -A -U -T -E -S, protes, P-R-A-U-T-E-S, and, protes. And here's what that word means. It means... Uh, controlled strength or strength uh, under control. It, it's like a stallion that has been broken and bottled up for the master's use. I had an uncle Dave, my bro daddy's brother, one of the meanest men I've ever known in my life, uh, but he liked food with horses. And I'd, I'd go over to uncle Dave's house and I'd ride those horses. He had an old stallion named Midnight. And uh, Midnight, um, I, I got on him one time and he about decapitated me when he ran me under the clothesline. I, I just about lost it right there. But my Uncle Dave had a way of breaking those horses. Now, when Midnight was broken, um, he still was massive amount of muscle and strength and Power, but after the brokenness came, it that midnight then was uh, controlled by the master. He was still just as powerful, still just as strong, but it was under control. We, we have a lot of blessings that are going to flow out of this thing today, and uh, I want to talk to you about gentleness and the blessings that come. I have eight of them, and I hope you'll write them down. And I'm gonna talk fast so you listen fast and we'll get out of here in plenty of time today, okay? So here's the first blessing, you ready? Gentleness neutralizes conflict. Gentleness neutralizes conflict. Gentleness is the bomb squad that's called to come 
and defuse the bomb of anger. Now watch this in, in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse one. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Have you ever noticed this about us? Have you ever noticed this about you? You respond in like fashion to the people that are addressing you. If somebody is angry with you, you normally will turn around and get angry with them. If they are approaching you with a high volume and loud, you're going to get high volume and you're going to be loud in return. Uh, if you're around somebody that is uh, maybe in deep grief, then you respond back with sympathy. If you hang around somebody that is depressed and you spend any length of time with them at all, you're going to wind up being depressed too. If you spend a lot of time with people that are energetic, guess what? You get energetic in return. So if you get around somebody that's angry and upset, typically what we do in our flesh is we respond in the same fashion. Uh, so I want to give you a tip here this morning that I believe will help you. You ready? If you're ready, say amen. When other people raise their voice, lower yours. Uh, it'll save you a tremendous amount of uh, heartache uh, when you do. Uh, Ecclesiastes, powerful book, got a tremendous amount of insight and wisdom for us. Uh, in the 10th chapter and the 4th verse is a great help because some of you are going to go to work tomorrow, just like the guy who came and talked to me after the last service. Going to go to work tomorrow and uh, they have a boss that is always in their face and has always got issues and, 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 and maybe harsh in their approach to their employees. Listen to what the word says. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. In other words, your boss shows up tomorrow and he's just so angry, don't get so mad that you quit your job. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. Now here's the deal. A lot of times when you go to work and your boss gets in your face about something, you know, normally it's really not about you. You don't know what that guy's been going through. You don't know what she's been going through. You don't know what they've been facing. You don't know what stimulated that. And most of the time what is directed to you is not about you. So you respond according to the word of God. He says, don't leave, keep calm, and it will lay great offenses to rest. All right, let me give you number two. Gentleness negates the critics. Um, here's something that you need to know. The more successful you are and the higher on the ladder you climb and the higher ranks that you are in the culture and society, the more gossip and the more criticism is going to come your way. It's just the natural thing that happens. And any time that you stand for something rather than falling for everything, it's going to evoke a lot of criticism from people toward uh, you. And the Bible says that you are to respond gently. And what happens is it negates the criticism that they have toward you. Do you know why? because they wind up getting disappointed. Now here's what's happening, and you know this to be true. There are a lot of people that are addicted to anger. You may be married to one of them. They're just kind of trolling the internet. They're trolling social media. They're trolling your posts, and they are trying their best to find something that they can oppose, something that they can get issue with, something that they can jump on and criticize and be angry about because they're addicted uh, to anger and they're searching the atmosphere for something that they can jump on. You may be married to somebody like that. You may have a parent that, that's... Uh, like that. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 4 says. 
Verse 13, when we are slandered, answer kindly. Uh, in other words, when people slander your character, when they gossip about you, when they jump on you, the last thing you want to do is retaliate. The last thing you want to do is to respond in the same way that they, you know, now let me help you understand why. Because if somebody is opposing you and they've jumped on you and, 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 and they've taken issue with you about something and you respond kindly, what it does is it puts you in a morally superior position than what they are. And if you start responding in the same fashion that they came at you with, what it does is it puts you down on the level with them. So you want to respond gently. Don't retaliate and respond kindly. Watch this in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 8. The Bible says, In soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now let me help you understand something. I'm still learning this. You know, I'm, um, I'm 47 years old and, 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 and I'm still learning all this stuff. All right, Get, let me give you number three. Gentleness negotiates with those who are contrary. Gentleness negotiates with those who are contrary. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 15. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue, listen to this, a gentle tongue can break a bone. Back when I was uh, working at Sears in Greenville, um, 1972, 73, somewhere thereabouts, my department was right beside the sewing machine and vacuum cleaner department. Now, there were some old boys in there in that department <clears throat> that uh, they were high-pressure, loud salespeople. And I watched them literally as somebody would be coming up the escalator. They would step out of their department. and they, that, Now, they're coming up the escalator probably to go pay a bill in the credit department. And they will stop them as they're getting off that escalator and they would start putting this high pressure sales pitch on them about how much they needed a new vacuum cleaner or a new sewing machine. I'm sitting standing over there in amazement at how often somebody going to pay their bill would turn around and go buy a vacuum cleaner that they really didn't come in there for nor need. High pressure salesmanship uh, was also in my day was... Uh, used evangelistically. I was walking down the streets as a six-year-old kid in Brevard, North Carolina when this tall, bearded evangelist who had been preaching on the street corner grabbed me by the arm and jerked me into an alley and said, boy, do you know that you're gonna die and go to hell? You, you know, that stuff just doesn't work anymore. And may I say to you, that high-pressure salesmanship persuasiveness doesn't work at home either. It doesn't work with your spouse, and it doesn't work with your kids. It's no longer applicable. I, I remember when I moved up here in 1983, you turn your television on on Saturday mornings, and... Uh, there they would be, high-pressure car salesmanship with spot on the hood of the car shouting how much you needed a new car. Well, nowadays, people are ordering cars off the Internet that they hadn't even seen before, having them delivered to their houses. It, it, it's, it's a new day. So when you read Proverbs 25, 15, uh, through a patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bone that means, ladies and gentlemen, that a gentle tongue can absolutely be effective with the most hard-headed people, hard -head, break a bone, hard-headed people. Now, Proverbs 16, 21 says, the wise in heart are called discerning 
and gracious words, gentle words, promote instruction. Now, I want you to hold on to this statement. You ready? I am never persuasive when I am abrasive. I am never persuasive when I am abrasive. Say that out loud. I am never persuasive when I am abrasive. Let me give you number four. Gentleness is noticeably charming. Now, if you want to be attractive, ladies, if you want to be attractive, then be gentle because the fact of the matter is I attract what I am. You attract what you are. If you want a godly man, then be a godly woman. If you want a godly woman, then be a godly man. You attract what you are. First Timothy, Paul writes and says, but you, O man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is about Boaz and Ruth. How many of you remember the story of Boaz and Ruth? Boaz was very wealthy, well-to-do kind of guy. Single. <clears throat> Looks out his window one day <clears throat> and he sees a bunch of gleaners out in his fields picking up the leftovers from the harvest. Um, kind of a normal practice back in those days. Uh, you would have the harvesters go in and they weren't able to get everything. They get most things, but they weren't able to get everything. And so Boaz is there and he's looking. Now, he could have responded out of anger and selfishness and pride, but instead of that, he says, you know what? We've got the best. Let's, let's minister to these poor people. Let's Let's be gentle with them. I, I, I could have locked them up for trespassing, but instead I'm going to be gentle with them and I'm going to let them provide for some of their needs. In the midst of one of those gleaners, in the midst of the gleaners was one of a, a, a good-looking woman by the name of Ruth. Ruth was a young widow. Um, and this young widow, instead of saying, well... <laughs> My husband's family won't have anything to do with me. I'm not going to have anything to do with them, so I'm just going to look out for number one and I'm going to take care of myself. No. She says, my mother-in-law needs me and I want to take care of my mother-in-law. not going to respond unkindly. I'm going to respond gently. And so she's out in the field and she is gleaning from the field and the leftovers, taking care of her mother-in-law. Boaz sees her, uh, gets a little bit inquisitive about her, invites her to come to his house for dinner, and they begin a relationship that wound up them getting married. Now, the beautiful part about this is, is that Boaz was a Jew, but Ruth was not. Jewish men were not allowed in those days to marry outside the Jewish race. But he did anyway. He was kind and he was gentle. She was kind and she was gentle. And they were attracted to each other. They wound up getting married and guess what? You get over into Matthew, the first chapter in the genealogy of Jesus, there are four women that are mentioned and one of them is Ruth a non-Jewish woman in the lineage of Christ. You, you, you get the point. Gentleness is noticeably charming. Gentleness attracts gentleness. First Peter chapter three, women, I want you to listen very carefully uh, to this passage. It, talks up, it says, your beauty should not come from the outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, your beauty should be that of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. Well, to pay a particular attention to that little word in there, unfading, 
may I tell you ladies here this morning, <laughs> natural beauty just doesn't last. I don't care how much makeup you try to smear on it. it you, 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 physical beauty fades away. Can I get a witness? Amen, men? I mean, it just, no, you better not. But the Bible says there is an unfading beauty of the inner person. And that is of a gentle spirit that never fades, but just grows and gets more beautiful with every passing day. Gentleness attracts gentleness. Let me give you number five. You ready? Gentleness nurtures compassion. Now, every husband needs to hear this. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now let me just say this, any fool can be harsh, any fool can be selfish, any fool can be rude, but gentlemen are gentle men. Um, Kathy and I have been married for 50 plus years. Uh, I'll give you a great example of what a successful marriage looks like. A successful marriage is two forgivers. During the course of the 50 years, my wife and I have hurt each other numerous times, over and over again. But what has caused the 50 years to be a reality is because we both have realized the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness is gentleness. Gentleness is forgiveness. I think about uh, the scriptures, how powerful they uh, really are in, in the word here. Um, in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, talking to parents, and it, it uses the term fathers, but I, I do believe that mothers could also be uh, included in this verse. It says, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the fear and the admonition, the encouragement and the instruction of the Lord. What, what does that word exasperate mean? It, it, it means that you don't put levels of expectations on your kids that they can never attain. It, it means that you don't put a bar up there that they will never be able to reach. It, it means that you quit trying to make your kids into something that God never intended nor designed them to be, but discover what the bent and the leaning and the tendency of your kids is that God has birthed into them and help develop that in them with gentleness and kindness. Let, let me give you number six. Uh, I like number six. Gentleness nets, N-E-T-S, nets coolness. You want to be a cool person? Hey, hey, women, do you want to be a cool woman? Proverbs chapter 11 says in verse 16 that a gracious woman gains honor. A gentle woman will gain and receive the respect from other people. You want to be respected? then you be like Mother Teresa and you be a gentle person. Y'all know Mother Teresa? You remember? She was about that high on a good day. Very diminutive, very frail, very gentle. But I'm telling you, when she walked into Congress, she put the fear of God into every representative in that place. She had that much respect. And if you want to be respected, then become a gentle person. Want to be cool? <laughs> be a gentle person. I think about David. Uh, David uh, rallied the 12 tribes of Israel together 
into the kingdom. I mean, it, was, it, it became very powerful when God used his leadership to put the uh, capital back where it belonged and to um, bring the nation together as one people. And then he handed the reins off to his son Solomon. And you all know that Israel flourished under Solomon like no other time in its history. And Solomon handed the reins off to his son Rehoboam. Rehoboam was a young whippersnapper who didn't know uh, anything about anything. And yet here he is assigned to be the ruler of the nation of Israel. Now he did a couple of things right. Uh, one of the things is, is that he called for the elders to come around him and he says to them, now boys, I, I'm young. I'm not like my daddy. I'm not like my granddaddy. I don't have all of those leadership skills and, and, and I don't have all of that experience. And he says to the elders, would you please help me and give me some advice on how I can be successful in leading the nation of Israel? They told him two things. They said, Rehoboam, first thing is, be a servant to the people. Don't be a dictator. Don't be a manipulator. You be a servant to the people. And the second thing is, don't talk down to them. You know, you're the king, no doubt about that, but just don't talk down to them. A couple, great advice, two good directions. But, but he didn't stop there. He went a step further and he says, I, I, want, I want my peers to come. And so, he asked some people who had no experience that were about his own age, had no clue about life or leading, and they told him the direct opposite of what the elders told him. And you know, from that moment on, uh, he listened to them rather than the elders and the kingdom crumbled. I see uh, Steve and Kathy Jacks with us. Uh, they will bear witness to the truth of what I am about to tell you. He and I pastored uh, the same church at different times. But my first church was a little country church, a little mountain church in the northwestern corner of South Carolina. I was 26 years old when I became pastor. The, past, uh, the, the church uh, was founded by my predecessor, and he had been there for 28 years and he retired inside the church. And I thought, uh, I don't know if this is going to be very good or not. And so I, I went to seek the advice of some other preachers and they filled my head full of negative thoughts. A week after I became pastor, I lost my voice and I couldn't speak above a whisper. And so I came to the conclusion, you know what? I'm not going to ask that guy to preach. I'm going to show him and I'm going to show this church there is a new sheriff in town. <laughs> and so I got other people to come and fill the pulpit for me the f six times that I was out of that pulpit because I couldn't speak. A couple of years after I left the church, I realized what a dumb mistake that that was. You understand that it was not that harshness. It, it should not have been the gruffness nor the domination that would have gained me the respect, but a gentle spirit, a humble spirit, and serving others would have gained me what I was looking for, a whole lot better and a whole lot easier. Now let me give you the next. You ready? Number seven. Non-believers catch gentleness. Titus chapter 3, verse number 2. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. Do you know that as a believer that you don't have a right to speak evil about anybody else? I guess that was a little weak because some of you didn't hear it. I, I want to say it again. As a believer, you don't have any right to speak evil against anybody. Back uh, early 1990s, 
I really didn't think I was going to make it through the test that God was putting me through here at this church. It was horrible. I, I tried to leave and couldn't leave. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into the description of all of it. I just, just say for about two years, uh, the intensity of the battle was as great as it could have ever been. The slander, the gossip, the ill will that was directed toward me and, and my family was just amazing. Several years later, after that, I was talking to one of the deacons who was here at that time, and uh, he shared with me a story about a time that he was talking to my son. And he, he recounted all of that stuff with my son that we had gone through and how ugly that it really was. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest things that I am thankful for today is the response that my son gave him. And he looked at my deacon and he said, you know what? You're telling me things that I never knew. I never heard my daddy ever say a negative word about any of those people. You understand, the word of God is very, very clear. And we are responsible of our actions that we don't say or do anything that is going to cause the lost person not to want to be saved. Uh, they, they're caught. And so lost people are looking at our lives and they're asking the questions, are you real? Are you genuine? Do you compromise? Do you live a life of integrity? And they're listening and they're watching what comes out of our mouths. And we don't have a right to cause our ungentleness and our harshness to be a stumbling block to those that may be lost. By the way, lost people read your posts too. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. You don't compromise what you believe. You don't surrender your convictions. But you treat everybody with respect. All right, let me give you number eight and I'll close with this one. You ready? <clears throat> Gentleness natures me like Jesus. Gentleness natures me like Christ. Um, I could probably give the invitation at this point with this statement. Um, if you're going to be a godly man, if you're going to be a godly woman, you're going to have to learn gentleness. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So how many of you watching through the internet, or how many of you are here in this building this morning, you're stressed to the max, or you're completely exhausted physically, emotionally, or spiritual? Could it be that the reason that you are stressed out, the reason that you are exhausted, could it be that you're not a gentle person? Because the Bible says if you're going to be like me, I can take that yoke upon you, I can take that burden from you and you can put my yoke on you and you will be at peace and you will be at rest and you will be gentle because I am gentle. By the way, um, <laughs> you can't fake it. Y'all hear me up there? You can't fake it. You can't just up and decide. I, I'm going to be gentle from now. I can tell you right now. 
I've done that a million times. That doesn't work. You know why it doesn't work? Because if you study the scriptures, you find out that gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's an inside job that only God can do in you and through you. And maybe it's just time that some of you come to the conclusion you've tried to do it in your own strength long enough and it's time to get to the point that you realize that God, I surrender here. I can't do this and if it's going to get done, you've got to do it for me. It's an inside job. I got three assignments for you this week, okay? Inevitably, at some point in time this week, uh, you're going to be in a situation um, where somebody is going to be serving you. Uh, maybe a bank teller, um, maybe um, a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant. But somebody's going to be serving you and things may not necessarily go just exactly like you think that they ought to go. Can I just simply get you to the point that you could learn to be more patient rather than demanding? There's a second um, thing that's probably going to happen and most likely will happen if not in the confines of your own home, it's going to happen somewhere on your job or out in the community somewhere, uh, everybody's not going to agree with you. Hmm? That doesn't mean that you have to be disagreeable. Now, you don't have to throw your convictions in the trash can and just acquiesce. But what you can do is not be disagreeable and be gentle. The third thing that inevitably is going to happen sometime this week is that you're going to be disappointed in some other person. They're not going to live up to some expectation that you have. Or they may have some failure. By the way, Galatians 6 is still intact. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest you be found out in the same situation that they're in. Um, you're going to get disappointed in somebody. I challenge you, don't be judgmental. Be gentle. Somebody's serving you, be patient and gentle. Somebody going to disagree with you? Don't be disagreeable. Somebody disappoints you? Don't be judgmental. Be gentle. Would you stand with me and let's just pray for a minute together? Now, Father God, I want to thank you for bringing us together here in this place. And I want to thank you for those that have joined uh, through the great plan of the media that you've allowed us to be a part of. And... Um, Father, I want to pray for every family. I want to pray for the husbands. And I want to pray for the wives, and the moms, the dads, the kids. Lord, I suspect that every one of us in this room could be a lot better at this than uh, maybe we have been in the past. God, help us to realize this morning that uh, we don't have the ability, but we can be willing for you to do it through us. So God, do what only you can do in our heart and our life and help us, Lord, to be gentle with those that are around us. I pray that you get glory in this invitation now. For somebody that needs to be saved, I pray, God, that you would open their eyes to see their need for Jesus. For those that need to join this church, God, move upon them and their heart so that, God, they could uh, feel connected, wanted, needed, and get plugged in, God, to be used of you to make a difference from this place.
pray all this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.